Hi, my name is Dr. Nicole Wanner, and I'm excited to uh, be able to speak with you today. In the first of two conversations I will be hosting, I'll focus on my personal experience as a parent of a child with mental illness. To all of you listening, simply by pressing play, you are contributing to making our community better. Thank you. I want to begin by extending my gratitude to and my sincere respect for the Niwa family. They have made two incredibly generous contributions to our community. One being monetary and the other their willingness and profound courage to use the loss of their husband, brother and son, Brandon, as an opportunity to make our community stronger and well informed and hopefully ultimately, to prevent similar tragedies in the future. I'm speaking as a parent who happens to be a doctor, but it's not my intent that this be seen as medical advice, ideal, or even something to strive for. I'm simply sharing our reality and our observations. I hope you'll be able to join me for my future conversation, where I'll be reviewing a map of sorts of the addiction and mental health services available for children and youth in Medicine Hat and surrounding areas. knew I wanted to be a doctor and as medical school drew to a close I really was very excited about my future career in family medicine but I can clearly recall not being excited about the high proportion of mental health visits that I knew were so commonplace in family medicine. I didn't mind the heart the kidney, the lungs, but when it came to the brain, or more specifically, mental health, I felt useless. Mental health visits, to me, were time consuming. They were emotionally draining, and there were no quick fixes. I found it so hard to help in these situations, but unfortunately, I had confused helping with curing. So as I moved into a practice of my own, I still felt those mental health visits were draining, but I also started to find a certain element of satisfaction in them. I started to appreciate the comfort that I was able to provide to individuals by simply offering a shoulder to cry on or a willing ear to listen. You know, we talk often about shame and stigma associated with mental illness and poor mental health, and I saw that every day. I would see the confusion in a patient's eyes as they questioned their right to complain because others had much bigger problems. They struggled to comprehend why they just couldn't cut it like everybody else. And these sentiments were expressed so frequently by so many people that I eventually came to have almost like a standard reply. And I would tell them, you aren't weak, you aren't alone, but we can see other illnesses. A diagnosis of heart disease or cancer makes an individual with that diagnosis a fighter, or they are a survivor if they beat their illness. They wear colored ribbons. They wear their survivor badge or status as a, as a badge of honor, and rightfully so. If I had a ribbon or a t-shirt for every patient I have seen suffering, with poor mental health or mental illness, I am convinced they would be everywhere. Having kids has made me a better doctor. Having three children of my own has taught me about many topics that I get asked about every single day, 
but I didn't learn anything about in medical school. Everything from breastfeeding to sleep or lack thereof, to screen time, to remote learning, and the importance of listening to a parent of a sick child. Just like being a parent taught me how to be a better doctor, I believe being a doctor has made me a better person. And more specifically, it's the stories that I have had the privilege to hear that have made me a better person. Sometimes being a better person means speaking up. So I'm speaking up so that other parents don't feel alone, so that other children can find help. I'm speaking up so that others might one day find the courage to speak up as well. Today, I'm wearing my I've had to ask for mental health help t-shirt for all of those people that I have told you're not alone and you don't need to be ashamed. This isn't just my story. This is the story of our family and I'm sharing it with their support and permission. I'm here to tell you that I have been there and they were some of the darkest days of my life. I'm here to tell you it was hard, it is hard, it shouldn't have to be so hard, and I'm here because I am committed to making it better. We do need to ensure that we're all speaking the same language. So before I go further, I need to be clear about the difference between mental illness and having poor mental health. Mental health is much like physical health, just like you might get physical pain, sore legs from climbing too many stairs. We get emotional pain, sadness or grief when we lose a family member. Emotions, good or bad, are normal. Someone once told me that our feelings are our body's way of telling us what it needs. And I do have to give some credit to Medicine Hat's own Mary Lou Goddard for that one. But take a moment and really think about that. The negative emotions that are so often associated with poor mental health, sadness, confusion, distraction, worry, we all get them. They are part and parcel of the human experience. When we don't have the right tools in our tool belt to address them or the situations that triggered them, they can become a problem and we might need additional help. You might be mentally unhealthy. Simply having these emotions doesn't mean you have a disease or an illness any more than your sore legs mean that you have arthritis. We then have mental illness. And poor mental health is not the same as mental illness. Major depressive disorder, ADHD, obsessive compulsive disorder, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, all mental illness. We are all born with our own genetic makeup. And for some of us, that means we have the potential, but not guarantee to develop a mental illness. Some of us may be predisposed to mental illness and given a multitude of circumstances, that disease may rear its ugly head. Mental illness is not weakness. It's not a failure or a choice. It's just illness, plain and simple. What happened to us? So yes, my years as a family doctor had allowed me to appreciate the worth of comforting someone in emotional pain. I had seen the impacts of mental illness and poor mental health on individuals and loved ones. My general strategy was listen, offer what comfort or encouragement I could, maybe give medicine if it was appropriate, provide a list of when you need help phone numbers, ask them to seek out a counselor, and maybe even give them a list of some names of local counselors. And I expanded my bag of tricks by completing a six month course of child and adolescent mental health. I knew mental illness wasn't easy, but little did I know that not easy was an understatement. So karma must have seen me strutting my stuff because four years ago, I was promptly knocked flat on my back. My son became suddenly and severely unwell. He didn't have a fever, he didn't have a rash, and if you looked at him, you probably wouldn't have thought he was sick, but he was. He was very, very sick. He developed a mental illness so severe that it consumed our lives for the better part of the next year, and it changed our lives forever. 
If you compared our experience to many others, ours was probably pretty good. Within five months, we had a diagnosis, a treatment plan, and a solid team of professionals that would be the envy of many families. Within six weeks of my son becoming ill, we had seen a pediatrician, he had started medication, and seen the first of what was to be multiple psychologists. But if that was good, I can't imagine typical. The wheels of the system that I had worked within and trained to have faith in started to turn in those first few weeks. And at this point, we could have concluded that the system will take care of us. And if he truly is that bad, we will get the help that we need and it will be provided to us. But thank goodness we listened to our guts because this, it didn't feel right. And sure enough, those wheels were spinning, but they were not gaining any traction or little traction. And so I recall around that time, I happened to be listening to a documentary about obsessive compulsive disorder in children. And they interviewed a mother named Lisa O'Connor, who had a child with OCD, but she also had a child with cancer. And her sentiment really resonated with me, and I'm gonna quote her directly. She said, it's a constant fight, trying to get her the help she needs. But for my other daughter, you just go to the meeting and then they give you a call and they say you be here on this date and she's going to have this radiation set up we're going to do surgery this will probably shock people but if i could choose between having a child with cancer or mental illness i'd pick cancer hands down end of quote. Our journey included being declined for services, receiving conflicting advice from multiple professionals, having to coordinate our own services, what seemed like constant drives to Calgary, our son missing close to 20 full school days of only the first four months of his school year for appointments alone, not for sick days, and ultimately my having to leave, take a leave from my work. Save for our hardworking pediatrician, our son's team was largely established thanks to Google and mummy blogs and reaching out to every professional I could think of contacting. It's important to advocate for you and for your family. But this was beyond advocacy, this was care coordination. If we had remained completely dependent on what was provided to us, I genuinely believe my son would not be doing as well as he is today. Right or wrong, and this is the may not be ideal part, what did we do? Once it became clear that something was wrong, I went into preservation mode for my son, for my family, for myself. I needed to fix this quickly. We did not have time for this. I didn't have time for this. I was not going to let this go on and on. I was going to stop it immediately. I frantically searched for cures, quick cures, anywhere everywhere. I just had to intervene quickly and nip this in the bud. If I truly was going to avoid all of my worst case scenario fears, I just had to make this go away or deny what I knew deep down to be true. I was from Medicine Hat. I was well established in our healthcare community. I was an active participant in my kids' education, on the parent council. I was aware of services and supports available to my kids within their schools. I gave this advice out every day, so I should have been able to help my own child. I spent hours every day contacting professionals, reviewing the research, and scouring the internet. Within the first week, I had contacted six professionals who were very well-versed in both local and provincial mental health services for youth. These included family physicians, pediatricians, child psychiatrists, social workers, psychologists, educators. There was no quick fix. This wasn't a phase. When fixing him didn't work, I got angry at him. He just needed a stern talking to. What if he was just making this up? This wasn't okay. He needed to stop it right now. And that was a no-go. I tried rationalizing with him. He was a smart kid, so I could just educate him back to health. Nope. I tried to bribe him. I would get him anything he would want just to get better. He asked for nothing. 
I stopped just short of begging him to just will himself better. We talked and we told the people that needed to know. I contacted his teacher before the school year started as this was happening in the summer and I let her know what was going on. I communicated regularly with his principal and teacher throughout the school year so I could ensure we were all clear about what strategies we were using and what we all were seeing. Don't allow others to make assumptions about you or your child. It is possible to be transparent and vulnerable without compromising your privacy. Mental health care can be awfully expensive. We spent a lot. The expense can come from the services and supports themselves, it comes from lost income, it comes from travel. There are limited publicly funded supports through Alberta Health Services and education and schools, but unfortunately they are completely overwhelmed. If you don't have any additional insurance, a private psychologist can cost anywhere from $125 to $250 an hour. Treatment of my son's illness cost our family in excess of $30,000, less than $10,000 of which was covered by insurance or support programs of any kind. We made really big decisions. When it became clear that this was no longer something we could handle part-time. I had to make the exceedingly difficult decision to step away from my job. A practice I had built over 13 years and spent 10 years training and educating to get to. So how did I feel when my son got sick? I didn't feel the same as when my daughter got diagnosed with an eye disorder or my other son a heart murmur. Of course, I was concerned about him, just like I had been for the other two. But this illness brought on an entirely different set of emotions. I felt shame. Had I caused this because I had a history of depression? This was the last thing I wanted to pass on to my son because I knew the incredible pain that caused me. Were my husband and I bad parents? Had we failed him somewhere along the line? Not paid him enough attention or paid him too much attention? Been too easy on him or maybe expected too much of our little boy? I felt doubt and I questioned my observations. I can't tell you how many times I asked my husband, my parents, my sisters, were they seeing? what I was seeing? Was I just making an issue out of normal adolescent behavior? Was I just being dramatic or making a mountain out of a molehill? Was this maybe just like other times in my training or in my career where I convinced myself that I or a family member had the worst case diagnosis? I felt fear, but so much more than fear. I was terrified. What would others think of him? What would others think of us? What would happen to him? He was a smart, kind, well-liked little boy. How would this impact his education? Would he be able to finish school, get a job, or have a family? How would he be treated by his friends or his peers or his teachers? And how would he be treated and managed by the very people that I needed to help him? Would they see weird or misbehaved or sick? It was clear his behavior had changed, but overall, he didn't look sick. I was struggling to understand myself. So how would all the others who weren't nearly invested in him as his parents understand? I felt less than. My son, had a severe illness, yet we were unable to readily access the treatment that he so desperately needed. We were so grateful to be seen at the Alberta Children's Hospital by a specialist, the national expert in his field. Our children had been seen by various specialists at this treasured institution for other conditions, and we had always walked away relieved, knowing we were in good hands. So this time, after a two hour our consultation, we were told our son had severe OCD and he required specific treatment. If he were treated incorrectly, he most definitely would get worse, but they couldn't provide names of anyone to treat him. Being told by the experts that my son would get worse 
without specific treatment that they couldn't provide, we were crushed. I felt sad. I cried. I cried and I cried and I cried. I cried to my husband. I cried to my sisters. I cried to my parents. I cried to his doctors. I often joked that I could judge how well he was doing by how many nights I went without crying myself to sleep. Even when he improved and was doing well, I cried. Whenever I had to tell our story again, I've been known to flippantly say, oh well, that was our trauma as an excuse for my tearfulness. And to this day, I feel shame for even using the word trauma. I was forced to consider the real potential of my son dying or having permanent life-changing illness with extraordinarily little response when speaking out. That's traumatic. I felt helpless. I was a doctor. I was his mother. I should be able to help my son and I couldn't. He was terrified of what was happening to him and he would say to us, why can't I go back to my regular self? I couldn't reassure him that it was going to be okay. I was furious. Since that time I've had the incredible privilege of hearing from other parents of children with mental illness and it was both heartbreaking and validating to hear that my pain was not unique. We all spoke with frustration of having to make our case or prove how bad things really were. We were too often labeled as difficult because after asking nicely too many times naturally, we get frustrated, we get angry, we didn't feel heard and we didn't feel seen. We hated having to break down before someone would take us seriously. I felt stupid. I was forced to accept how little I knew about mental illness, its treatment, the services available within our community. Mental illness like physical illness needs treatment from a whole team. Doctors, psychologists, educators, many others. And I as a doctor can prescribe pills but as I say often, pills don't give skills. Just like a diabetic needs to learn how to test their blood sugar or inject insulin, those with mental illness need to be taught specific skills to appropriately manage their illness. I had sent patients to counselors, but I now realized I didn't really know the difference between a counselor and a therapist and a psychologist and a social worker. It's important to realize that a sick child impacts your entire family. We may have had one child that was sick, but our other two children hurt. We had less time to spend with our other kids. At times they were jealous of their brother's doctor's appointments and days away from school or the extra attention he received. There were times they were angry that he got sick in the first place or embarrassed by how he was acting. We included them when possible. Attending occasional appointments allowed them to learn about their brother's illness, to ask the professionals their own questions and when appropriate, voice their own opinions. We did our best to spend one-on-one -on -one time with them when possible and often it just meant an extra cuddle at bedtime. But we did manage to do some bigger things like a mummy and me hike or day trip to Elkwater, or hot chocolate Saturday morning with dad. And these were important, but not sufficient for both younger kids. Our daughter especially needed the opportunity to talk through this experience with someone other than mom or dad, and that was okay. We place too much worth on doing things on our own. I too have to admit, I find it way easier to offer help than accept it. It is the support of our village that got us through my son's illness. And this may look different to different households, but for us, it was my sister picking up the kids from school when we couldn't be there. It was Nana and Papa making suppers or keeping kids overnight. It was being able to stay with my sister when we were in Calgary for appointments or my other sister walking me through social supports for sick kids. It was the love and cheerleading of family and friends and our entire kids' school family. And I truly can't thank all of those individuals enough. Reach out to your village, whatever it may look like, and accept help when it's offered, because you can pay it back down the line. Take time for yourself, even if it's short. I took salsa lessons. These were my one night a week where I could laugh, escape, 
imagine I was on a beach someplace. I also had to access professional support that was available to me through the Alberta Medical Association. And this allowed me to help myself, but it also reinforced to my kids that getting help is sometimes not just okay, but necessary. My husband and I even had a few couples therapy sessions and we would jokingly refer to those as our date nights because it was the only time that it was just the two of us. So don't forget what you learned growing up or what you learned from others. Don't forget the chicken soup. My son needed professionals, but in the big scheme of things, they were only a small part of his recovery. Remember the importance of mental, of being mentally healthy, whether or not we have a mental illness. Our bodies are built for doing hard things. When I was a little girl, I remember going to brownie camp and learning the song, Going on a Bear Hunt. And each verse would bring a different challenge faced on your hunt, but always reached the same conclusion. You can't go around it. You can't go over it. You can't go under it. We gotta go through it. The emotional challenges that we find along the great bear hunt of life require we bring along the tools in our tool belt. Some tools we consciously reach for, like a hot bath when we're anxious or punching a pillow when we're angry. Some we just do because they're fun or we like them, like having a movie night or playing a board game, a game of basketball or golf or a visit with friends. Some really aren't great tools at all. Substance abuse or avoidance or the head in the sand approach being two. Ideally, we identify our bad tools and replace them with better ones. My husband and I chose to take our children by the hands and persevere through this. We chose to make sure they knew we all could do hard things. We didn't hide our feelings from them. We felt it important that they know that even grown-ups hurt. We passed on the good tools we were already using, but collectively, our entire family learned about new tools and made efforts to replace some of our bad ones. We struggled. We didn't always know the answers, but that's okay. We did our best, and that's all we expected of our kids. They were so incredibly fortunate to learn these skills at such a young age. Skills that will guide them through difficult times now and throughout their lives, that will help them to support friends and family and neighbors and co-workers. But it's important that we told them and that we all understand that having a great set of tools does not mean that we're going to be happy all the time. Sometimes our tools make us feel better, but sometimes they simply allow us to acknowledge the hurt to feel the hurt and wait for it to pass because it does pass. And I needed this reminder. I was able to finally believe that no matter the outcome of his illness, my son would be okay. We can do hard things. We can do mental illness. We can do illness of any kind. We can do failure. We can do worldwide pandemics. We need to pay attention to our tool belts, build them up, and help those around us to do the same. Our experience also made me incredibly proud. Despite the significant impacts they faced as siblings of a sick child, my two younger children emerged as compassionate and incredibly emotionally intelligent individuals. That came out of love for themselves and their brother. My eldest persevered through unending hurt, confusion, and medical appointments. And he emerged on the other side as a confident, kind, amazing young man. I'm proud of myself. I chose to use our story as an opportunity for the change and to make things better. I've chosen to get out of my comfort zone by asking the questions that need to be asked and connecting with those that have the ability to contribute to the creation of what I know in my heart is possible. I'm proud of the important partners that came to the table and continue to come to the table. The Medicine Act College, school divisions, Alberta Health Services, government, social services, and most importantly, our youth. 
I've heard that sometimes the best things in your life come from the worst things in your life. Without my son's illness, I would not be doing the most gratifying and exciting work of my life. All focused on mental health and illness. Having the incredible opportunity to help other children and young adults just like my son. I'm far from naive enough to believe that simply calling up specialists or accessing therapy for your entire family or stepping away from your job is even remotely possible for most. We were incredibly fortunate, but I believe this shouldn't be left to fortune. I'm doing my best every day to ensure our mental health system works better for all youth and all of their families and caregivers. As we work to make this a reality, lessen your load where you're able and reach out to your friends, family, and neighbors when possible. In the darkest days of his illness, my son told us he believes he got sick because he was strong enough to handle it. And his experience would allow him to give hope to others. Mental illness is frightening. You might be afraid of yourself, you might be afraid of your future, afraid of what others will think of you, and truly afraid that you might never feel better. And I have found one of the most important comforts I could offer my son, but also my patients, was hope. Hope that there is help. Hope that they will get better. Hope that they can lead successful, productive lives. I'm doing my best to build that hope by sharing our story, by ensuring we all know we can do hard things and contributing to the creation of a stronger, more effective network of mental health and addiction services. So I'd like to thank you all for your attention. I know our family has learned so much since this journey began. There is nothing little about mental illness and and the immense elephant of stigma and disability and system complexity that engulfs it. But how do you eat an elephant? This is exactly what we're doing here. You eat it one bite at a time. Thanks very much.